I hope you have enjoyed the conference so far, and uh, weather has been with us, and uh, uh, I hope you've had your refreshments, your coffee, and you're ready uh, for our distinguished uh, keynote speaker. Uh, I'm very happy to uh, introduce Emma Ushioda. Uh, she is uh, at the University of <laughs> I can't do it without my glasses now, and I just want to make sure I had it right. Okay. She's involved in uh, postgraduate teaching, but she's best known as a researcher in motivated, motivation and autonomy. And I'm sure that she will do a much better job of discussing this than I will, so I will uh, ask you to give her a big hand and uh, we look forward to your speech. Thank you very much. Can you all hear me? Yes. Thank you very much, Douglas, for that very um, kind introduction. Um, and thank you to the Jazz Hall Conference Committee for inviting me here. This is my first time in Kyushu. First time in Fukuoka. I have visited Japan before, and as you can probably guess from my physiognomy and from my name, I am ethnic. Technically, I'm Japanese because my parents are both Japanese. But my main claim to fame, as some of you already know, is that I'm probably the first Japanese person who was born in Ireland, <laughs> <laughs> um, and I was born and educated in Ireland. I spent most of my most of my life living in Ireland and. Um, and I've only lived in Japan for three years. That was a long time ago. I was teaching English in Japan from 1982 to 85. Which kind of gives you, gives away my age. When of course I was teaching when I was only three years old. <laughs> <laughs> um, and since then I've visited Japan a few times because I've been invited to give talks and so on. But I've not really spent any more extended period of time in, in Japan. So I feel in some ways a bit like a fish out of water. Although I am Japanese, I don't really, I haven't lived in Japan very much, not recently. The last time I taught in Japan was in 1985, a long time ago. I also feel a bit of a fish out of water because, as I've been saying to many people at the conference, I was actually very surprised to receive an invitation to the JALP Core conference because those of you who know my work will know that I'm not really a core person. I'm not a technology expert by any means. Um, so I feel as if, you know, I'm the one doing all the, the learning at this conference and I'm hoping that some of the things that I will say to you over the next hour or so may be informative to you, but I, I do think that the learning is going to happen the other way around. And I'm going to talk about autonomy and motivation because the theme of the conference is learn or autonomy. So the work that I do in the area of autonomy and motivation, I think that that's probably why I've, I've been invited as a speaker to this conference. Um, I'm going to begin with a story, okay, um, and many years ago, when I was a child growing up in Ireland, there was a Japanese professor of English, uh, English literature, who was visiting Ireland on, I think it was a sabbatical for a few months. Um, now, in those days, the Japanese community living in Ireland was very small. There were probably only fewer than 20 Japanese people living in, in Ireland. And, and my parents were the most long-standing Japanese residents in Ireland because my father had emigrated to Ireland, I think, in 1959 or 1960. And this was before there was even a Japanese embassy in Ireland. So it's a long time ago. So in those days, whenever any Japanese person visited Ireland, inevitably they tended to gravitate towards my parents whenever they needed any help or advice with any aspect of life in Ireland. And so this Japanese professor of English turned up on our doorstep one day, only a few days after he arrived in Dublin. And he seemed very dejected um, because apparently, he told us, he had completely lost confidence in his English language skills. I suppose this is very good if you're a professor of English. So my parents sat him down with a cup of tea, or perhaps it was 
asked him to explain what the problem was, why did he feel that he had lost confidence in his leadership and language skills. So this professor explained that before he came to Ireland, he knew that he would need time to get used to the Irish English accent, because he knew that this was going to be very different from the British English or American English accents that he had been used to. So he thought that as a kind of learning strategy, what he would do would be to watch the television news on Irish television and to get used to the Irish English accent. So I guess we could call this a learning strategy by an autonomous language learner using a particular technology, television, for language learning purposes. And so this Japanese professor switched on the little television set in his hotel bedroom in Dublin. Now you've got to remember that this is of course in the good old days of black and white television, little tiny televisions, um, and of course when the quality of the picture was not very good, very grainy and blurry. And also in those days, the Irish National Television Service, I think broadcast for only a few hours in the evening. So it wasn't as if it was a day long service. And as for the news bulletin, this was literally just um, a news reader reading the news to camera, just to a talking head. So there are no kind of special film reports from local correspondence, no fancy visuals or titles or headlines, nothing like that. Just a talking head reading the news to camera. And this Japanese professor of English was shocked because he discovered he couldn't catch a word that was being said. Not a single word. So this accent, the Irish English accent, was truly very different from any form of spoken English he had come across before. And so it was in this very kind of dejected and demotivated state that he had landed on my parents' doorstep seeking advice and consolation and perhaps a stiff drink. His autonomous learning strategy of using technology for language learning purposes clearly had failed miserably. Now, of course, as it transpired, there was a very simple and rather amusing explanation. Because it turned out that this professor had inadvertently been watching the news on Irish television, not in its English language version, <laughs> but in the Gaelic Irish language <laughs> Um, because it's Irish news broadcast in Irish once a day. So no wonder he couldn't follow the word that was being said. And no wonder he had felt so demotivated about his English language skills. So this little story of this Japanese professor introduces us to, I think, to some of the um, things I want to talk about concerning autonomy and motivation and the business of using technology for language learning purposes. And as you have, would have seen if you've had a chance to look at the abstract of my talk, I'm going to make a sort of um, distinction between, it's a sort of distinction, small but significant semantic distinction, if you like, between language learning technologies and technologies for language learning. Now you're probably thinking I'm being very pedantic here, but I think the distinction is a useful one. And um, so technologies, language learning technologies, so these would be technologies perhaps that have been ped specifically pedagogically designed for language learning purposes, such as maybe call programs or particular software tools or applications that have been designed for language learning or language teaching. And on the other hand, everyday technologies that can be used or exploited for language learning purposes such as the internet, various inter um, communication, digital technologies, mobile technologies, and so on, or of course television. Now, it's not of course a hard and fast distinction between language learning technologies and technologies for language learning, but I think the distinction is a useful one, because it points to some important psychological differences in how language learners may conceptualize and relate to particular technologies or technological affordances. And so it points to useful psychological differences in the quality of their autonomy and motivation when it comes to engaging with these technological resources. And so my purpose in this talk is, if you like, to explore these psychological differences in autonomy and motivation from a theoretical perspective and to consider their implications then for how we as teachers 
might enhance the quality of language learners' engagement with technological resources. Now, as I was saying, my own background, of course, is not in technology. It's very much in the sort of theoretical and pedagogical side of things, rather than the technological. In a previous life, some 20 years ago, I did double for a while in research and practice in computer-mediated communication in language learning. And to be specific, I was involved in an email tandem language learning project, a project, a bilateral project, where we paired up um, students of um, Irish students at universities who were learning German, and we paired them up with German students at university in German who were learning English. And through the email tandem project that was then based in the World University in Bochum in Germany, they had a, something called an e-tandem server that had a kind of dating agency where they paired up language learners who were looking for a language learning partner. So if you were French learning German and you were looking for a native German speaker who was learning French, so that you could pair up with them and exchange language and culture and so on. And so we were involved, or I was actually involved in coordinating this project where we had Irish and German students paired up with one another. And perhaps one measure of the success of our um, Irish-German email tandem project was that one of the email tandem student partnerships ended up as a romantic wedding partnership. Because <laughs> the students in question actually got married during the lifetime of the project. So, uh, aside from this um, successful experience of research and practice in email tandem some 20 years ago, my work has been concerned really more with the um, role of motivation and autonomy in language learning and teaching more broadly, rather than with the role of technologies per se. But nevertheless, I do hope that the sort of theoretical and pedagogical perspectives that I can offer in this talk will connect in some way with your experiences and practices as researchers and teachers who clearly do have expertise in technology. So I'm going to begin by drawing some um, important distinctions between different concepts of autonomy and motivation. Again, in a previous life, I once wrote that autonomous language learners are by definition motivated learners. This is back in 1996. And I've sometimes come to regret having written this because inevitably people have then often asked me, well, which comes first, autonomy? Or motivation. And in fact, this was almost the uh, title of a well-known article published by Mary Spratt and her colleagues in Hong Kong in 2002, which comes first, autonomy or motivation. In other words, do students need to be motivated first before you can develop their autonomy? Or do students need to have autonomy first in order to be truly motivated? I could have been a sip of water. What I'd like you to do is just have a little discussion with the person or person sitting next to you, what your thoughts are on that question. Which comes first, autonomy or motivation? There's no right or wrong answer. 
political sense of autonomy that is central to DC and Ryan's self-determination theory. Um, and this form of autonomy, if you like, is a prerequisite for what Edward DC calls motivation from within, in other words, internalized motivation, motivation that we bring to a particular situation. And so if we look at self-determination theory, a basic principle of self-determination theory is that we human beings have a kind of inborn, innate tendency towards what we might call psychological growth, with a kind of natural desire to explore our world, to master new challenges, to develop our skills, our abilities, and our competences, and to integrate these into an increasingly elaborated, yet coherent sense of self. In other words, our self-concept. So when we behave in ways and pursue courses of action that are true to our sense of self, or that are congruent with our own sense of self, then our motivation is self-determined and expresses our personal autonomy, our values, our desires, and so on. On the other hand, when our motivation and behavior are largely controlled by external social forces, teachers, parents, employers, perhaps peer pressures, and so on. So when our motivation is controlled by other people, then we act in ways that are less self-determined and less true to our self-concept. And this often results in more negative experiences and poorer quality engagement, or perhaps even leads to resistance or rebellion. So autonomy in this sense of personal agency or self-determination needs to come first in order for people to feel genuinely motivated. If people don't experience autonomy in this sense of self-determination or personal agency, their motivation will not feel their own, but will feel controlled or manipulated by other people, as in the typical sort of carrot and stick approach to motivation. But, there's always a but, isn't there? This um, autonomy one isn't enough. This psychological sense of autonomy, shaping self-determined motivation and action, doesn't necessarily lead to effective forms of learning. So for example, you might find that learners are freely and autonomously engaged in off-task behaviors during a language activity when they are not being monitored by the teacher. Or you may find that a very enthusiastic language learner spends a great deal of time autonomously doing language activities that she enjoys doing, but she might not pay that much attention to the less enjoyable or the more demanding aspects of language learning that perhaps she needs to work on. In other words, autonomy in this sense of personal agency may underpin self-determined forms of motivation, but this may not necessarily be the motivation that is needed to engage with the more cognitively or linguistically demanding aspects of language learning. So this is where we need to consider another alternative concept of autonomy. And as Martin Lamb explains, there is also autonomy in the sense of taking responsibility for managing and regulating your learning. So this is what we might more appropriately call learner as reflected, I think, in the title of the theme of this conference. Or even more specifically, as David Little, who was my boss for about nine years, he emphasizes language learner autonomy, because we are talking about language learners, students who are learning languages. So according to Little, autonomy in this sense implies both a willingness to take charge of one's language learning and also a psychological capacity for detachment, critical reflection, decision-making, and independent action. So it's more than just doing things that you want to do in a self-determined way, but it actually means thinking about what you're going to do 
working out how to do it and then acting independently. As a little aside, I like, I like this um, cartoon of the autonomous sheep, but it's actually not a very good cartoon because if I secretly show you what the caption says, I don't think you could read it, but it actually says, Sean, the name of the sheep, would finally die in a head-on collision with Charlie Mobile Cow. <laughs> Probably not a very good um, advert for so, autonomy in the second sense, or learner autonomy, this psychological capacity that David Little talks about, entails exercising metacognitive skills of self-regulation and strategic thinking to deal with, to address difficulties and challenges in one's language learning. And what's important, I think, is that the exercise of this metacognitive capacity presupposes a willingness or motivation to apply and control these higher order strategic thinking processes, which in turn regulate one's learning. So autonomy in this sense of self-regulation and metacognition clearly depends on motivation, because as Martha Bronson notes, self-regulated learning can occur only when the strategic ability to control strategic thinking processes is accompanied by the wish or the motivation to do so. So this is the integrated notion of motivation and autonomy that is captured very nicely in the catchphrase will and skill in the literature on self-regulated learning. In other words, willingness or motivation to exercise the metacognitive skill or effort needed to regulate one's learning. And this integrated notion is also reflected in the combination of willingness and ability in Bill Littlewood's um, early analysis of learner autonomy. So if we take both concepts of autonomy into consideration, we can say the following, that autonomy one, in that psychological sense of personal agency, underpins self-determined forms of motivation. And secondly, motivation from within underpins autonomy too, or learner autonomy, in the metacognitive sense of self-regulated learning. So in other words, in answer to the question, the trick question I posed earlier, which comes first, autonomy or motivation, we can see that it depends on which sense of autonomy we are talking about. So you're probably sitting there wondering, well, what do these conceptual distinctions have to do with language learner engagement with technologies. When is she going to get on to that? Well, I propose to consider each of these two concepts of autonomy in turn and discuss what um, implications and complexities they raise for how language learners may engage with technologies. And in doing so, I will also, of course, consider associated issues of motivation. So let's look, first of all, at autonomy one in the sense of personal agency and self-determination. Self and basically, the important pedagogical message here is that if we want to promote healthy forms of motivated engagement with language learning, we need to find ways of promoting and supporting students' sense of autonomy or self-determination. In other words, we need to ensure that students experience some degree of choice, freedom, and personal control in what they learn, or how they learn, when they learn, or where they learn. We need them to feel that within the constraints of the curriculum and the pedagogical framework within which we and they have to operate, that they have freedom or autonomy to create certain learning spaces for themselves to pursue particular goals or activities that they personally are interested in or value, and to make meaningful choices and decisions about the content and process of their learning. So if they experience a strong degree of autonomy or personal agency in this sense, their motivation is likely to be perceived as more self-determined and less externally controlled or regulated by social forces such as teachers or parents. And this can only be a good thing. 
So as you are no doubt thinking, the flexibility afforded by certain technologies, certain learning technologies, may certainly help in, small, in no small measure to provide learners with this sense of personal autonomy. And this is certainly true for modern day digital and mobile technologies, which afford students the freedom to choose when and where to learn, and which typically offer an attractive menu of options and tools and resources that they can choose from according to personal need or interest. Indeed, as I wrote in a commentary paper a couple of years ago, specifically in relation to mobile language learning, autonomy, flexibility, freedom, and choice are intrinsic features of mobile learning. And by exploiting these features, teachers and materials designers may well be able to promote internalized motivation for independent learning. So in other words, modern day technologies may have strong potential for fostering the kinds of autonomy that underpin self-determined forms of motivation. In this respect, of course, we, we need to remember or bear in mind that our students will clearly bring different kinds of personal relationship with technology to their language learning, which may in turn affect their sense of autonomy and motivation as language learners. So as Glenn Stockwell, who's sitting here somewhere in the audience, as he wrote in 2013, there are of course those students who are very tech savvy, who have strong interests in technology. And so this interest in technology may then lead to discovering the benefits of technologies for language learning. And so this may, may then enhance their motivation for language learning. And then there are also those students who perhaps have a, a motivation or an interest in language learning. And then when they encounter a particular technology that can support or enhance their language learning in flexible or interesting ways, then this may further strengthen their motivation as language learners. So either way, if students perceive that working with technology can support their sense of autonomy as language learners by offering flexibility or freedom, choice, and so on, this is likely to enhance their motivation. So in both cases, it's a kind of win-win situation for autonomy and motivation. Moreover, since digital and mobile technologies <coughs> constitute an integral part of students' personal and social lives outside the classroom, by making this connection between personal technology use and language <coughs> learning, it may help to reduce what David Little has called the barriers between learning and living <coughs> that formal educational structures can often create. And here, Little is referring in particular to Douglas Barnes's well-known distinction between school knowledge and action knowledge, a distinction that has formed a cornerstone for arguments for promoting autonomy. <coughs> school knowledge is the knowledge that we as teachers try to present and transmit to our students. But if students are not enabled to use and transform this knowledge for their own purposes, School knowledge does not become action knowledge. In other words, the knowledge that informs and shapes their actions and behaviors in their lives outside the classroom. Where learning English is concerned, it seems that in the current era of global English and globalization and so on, these barriers between school knowledge and action knowledge, between learning and living, between formal English lessons in school, and leisure time engagement with English outside school, these barriers or dissonances are becoming an increasingly significant motivational issue for young people in many educational contexts. In Sweden, for example, um, Alistair Henry identifies what he calls an authenticity gap between contexts of using English in popular youth culture and contexts of formal English learning in school. So Henry reflects on the situation in Sweden where English has become such an integral part of young people's recreational activities outside the classroom, especially for young people 
who spend a great deal of their time engaged in online digital gaming, digital games such as Counter-Strike or World of Warcraft and so on. And as a consequence, Henry <coughs> argues that the problem for teachers of English in Sweden is not so much how to motivate students to learn English, but rather how to interest them in classroom-based English activities, which are far removed from their recreational English activities online. In other words, for Swedish teenagers, there seem to be two entirely different cultures within which they encounter English. One in school, in formal English classes, and one outside school, in the world of entertainment and digital <coughs> gaming. And so this authenticity gap between these two cultures is creating problems of autonomy and motivation for students and teachers. So in short, the argument would seem to be that we as teachers need to do our best to try to reduce this authenticity gap or to reduce the barriers between learning and living. In Japan, perhaps, maybe we might want to think about reducing the barriers maybe between <coughs> learning English for exams and learning English for communication. That may be where the gap is. And perhaps one way of doing that is to find meaningful ways of harnessing students' world of personal technologies, digital gaming or social media, and making these connections between everyday technologies and language learning. So here, we are sort of, to some extent, shifting the focus from pedagogically designed language learning technologies or software applications, and looking instead at how everyday technologies might be exploited for language learning purposes. But, as I said, there's always a but. In our efforts to reduce the authenticity gap or the barriers between students' lives inside and outside the classroom, of course, we as teachers must be careful that we don't go to the opposite extreme and run the risk of imposing ourselves on our students' personal and social worlds. Henry specifically warns against the wholesale importation of youth cultural content into the language classroom. And in a similar vein, Glenn Stockwell has also highlighted the risk of encroaching too much on what he calls students' private spaces by, for example, maybe integrating mobile learning into a language course. Because after all, students may regard their use of mobile technologies as their private territory or their private space. And they may want to keep this separate from what he calls their studying space. And this is a significant issue that has also been highlighted by Mark Sh Mike Sharples, who makes the point that generally speaking, students do not want school or institutionalized learning to intrude too much into their personal lives. And this may include, for example, their personal use of digital and social networking technologies. In short, bridging the gap between students' lives inside and outside the classroom doesn't mean that we should try to exploit their personal use of technologies for our language learning or language teaching purposes because students may not feel willing to allow language learning to suffuse or interfere with their everyday personal use of technologies. And there is a risk that they may end up expressing a different kind of autonomy, in other words, resistance, which is another kind of autonomy in this regard. Instead, as I suggested in 2011, Perhaps our strategy, our pedagogical strategy, should be to encourage students themselves to make their own relevant connections between language learning and their everyday use of technologies. In other words, perhaps we can help our students to see possible connections between, on the one hand, their personal use of digital and mobile technologies and social media to pursue their own real life needs and interests. And on the other hand, perhaps, the potential for using these everyday technologies and resources to develop their language skills in service of the same personal needs or interests.
or perhaps an expanded set of needs and interests. As Mike Levy observed in 2009, young people may not necessarily recognize such connections between their personal use of technology and the potential or the possibilities of exploiting it in creative ways for language learning. So in other words, we may find, going back to the two concepts of autonomy that I've highlighted, we may find that students can exercise autonomy one in the sense of personal agency, ownership, self-determined motivation, and so on. And they may freely and autonomously engage with language learning technologies, such as pedagogically designed software tools and resources. But these same students may perhaps lack autonomy too, in the sense of strategic thinking, metacognitive skills, or learner autonomy, they may lack this second kind of autonomy to understand how they can strategically and creatively exploit various everyday technologies for the purposes of developing, practicing, and using their language skills. So this distinction between the two senses of autonomy that I've highlighted I think it's useful because it points to important psychological differences in how language learners conceptualize and relate to pedagogically designed language learning technologies on the one hand and to technologies that can be creatively exploited for language learning purposes on the other. In simple terms, and it is a simplification, students may work freely and autonomously with language learning technologies that we as teachers present to them, but they will need to develop some degree of learner autonomy in order to engage strategically and creatively with everyday technologies for the purposes of language learning. So in the last part of my talk, I'm going to consider what pedagogical implications this raises for fostering this second kind of autonomy, learner autonomy. And again, I'll be drawing on some theoretical insights and perspectives that I think can illuminate this pedagogical process. And perhaps the first point to make is that, as in any form of cultural or social practice, the socio-cultural environment plays a significant role in shaping students' personal use of technology. Or to put it another way, our motivation to pursue culturally constructed forms of activity, culturally constructed goals and activities, which is using technology, is socially developed, socially formed, through our interactions with and influences from other people. And these people might be particular people that we know in our immediate social environment, our friends or colleagues and so on, but it also might be people in a more abstract, collective sense, in the wider socio-cultural environment, in society at large, or world at, the world at large. And here, of course, I'm drawing on a Vygotskyan socio-cultural perspective on language learning, motivation, and cultural practice. So in other words, motivation in this culturally shaped sense is not some kind of process of spontaneous combustion, but motivation is social form and distributed. And it develops through our involvement with and interactions in particular cultural practices and activities. So from a pedagogical perspective, this highlights the value of creating and fostering a classroom culture of personal technology use for language learning purposes, or perhaps fostering a local institutional culture for personal technology use for learning across different subject areas. And fostering such a culture, of course, would entail promoting and demonstrating the benefits and potential of everyday technologies, digital and mobile technologies, social media, internet resources, and so on, to support language learning and language use. And clearly, teachers themselves would be in a good position, or maybe in a good position, to provide such demonstration. But of course, developing a local culture may be more effective if the process is perhaps led in part by students' own 
peers who are perhaps already doing this, already engaging strategically, creatively with particular technologies for language learning purposes. Because in this way, other students may then be motivated to follow suit, to take the initiative to transform their own language learning experiences in imaginative and autonomous ways through technology. But, another but, creating a culture of personal technology use for language learning may not be enough in itself to promote the metacognitive dimension of learner autonomy. And as teachers, we would still need to play an important pedagogical role in raising students' awareness, awareness of the possible affordances, but also the possible limitations of particular technology in relation to language learning. And at one level, this might entail raising awareness of the properties of particular technologies. But perhaps more importantly, it also entails raising their awareness of the language learning process and developing students' metacognitive knowledge and strategic thinking skills. In relation to possible affordances of technology, for example, we might wish to draw our students' attention to the very simple but powerful language learning resource residing in the various forms of simple text-based online communication that they may engage in. Because after all, these text-based communications constitute a ready-made permanent archive of their own language output and interactions. And this archive may then provide a very valuable focus for analysis and critical reflection and for the development of metalinguistic awareness. And moreover, this permanent store of students' linguistic output can also then provide a very tangible means of tracking language development over time, which can help to instill a sense of personal progress and skill development which is, of course, psychologically important for sustaining motivation. In addition, as Mark Varshauer highlighted way back in uh, 1997, in the early days of computer-mediated <coughs> language learning, the simple text writing function of computers also provides a powerful metacognitive thinking resource. And this is because, as we type on screen, it automatically captures front of us are developing thoughts and understandings and our attempts to express these in linguistic form. And this developing text then can be used, as he says, to bootstrap our thinking in a more powerful manner than is normally possible in speech. And so Varshaw's argument here relates, of course, to the Vygotsky notion of language or writing, the technology of writing, as a cognitive tool to mediate and amplify our thinking. Now, as you may have noted, in relation to affordances of technology for language learning, I have very deliberately drawn attention here to examples of properties that help to raise students' awareness of the language learning process, rather than simply to features of technology that might facilitate language practice or social interaction or access to linguistic and cultural information. Because my sense is that on the whole, students are more likely to be aware of the latter kinds of features and potentials of technology, like looking things up on the internet and so on. But perhaps they might be less aware of the former kinds of properties, unless they already have a well-developed metacognitive capacity for language learner autonomy. However, while fostering students' awareness of the affordances of technology for language learning is one thing, we also need to draw their attention to its potential limitations. And again, I'm emphasizing here the general importance of developing students' meta-knowledge of the language learning process which may include 
awareness of what certain technologies can, but also cannot offer. In relation to metacognitive knowledge, I'm thinking here of the importance of raising students' awareness of different kinds of learning processes that they may engage in as language learners, such as, for example, the difference between explicit versus implicit forms of learning. So explicit is where you are paying explicit attention, say, focus on the form, looking specifically at the grammatical features. Implicit is where you are focusing on something else, but implicitly you also pick up typically vocabulary and so on. Formal versus informal or incidental learning. So formal learning is typically the kind of learning that would happen in the classroom. Informal learning might be if they're playing with some kind of computer game and informally picking up some English as they do it, or incidentally picking up some English. Um, Deductive versus inductive learning. So deductive is where you are presented with the rules of the language rules and then you try to practice those rules. Inductive is where you are presented with the language and you try to work out the rules for yourself. Deep versus surface learning approaches. So deep learning approaches would be where you are engaging in deep learning, critical engagement with the information content, um, making connections with that new information and your existing knowledge trying to integrate that into your long-term memory. Surface learning approaches, typically this would be much more superficial kind of memorization approaches, what you might do the day before an exam and so on. And, and sustained learning versus the increasingly popular micro-learning. So sustained learning is where you learn intensively over a concentrated period of time. And micro-learning is the typical sort of bite-sized chunk learning that is very typical of mobile learning and various forms of e-learning these days. So while it may be a very good thing to promote a culture of using personal technologies for language learning purposes on the one hand, I think we don't want to end up fostering the view that language learning is necessarily always best when it happens informally, implicitly, incidentally, superficially, as we engage with everyday technologies. And we don't want to foster the view that we can make sufficient progress simply by dipping in and out of language learning in small bite-sized chunks while on the move or in between other activities. I recently came across, just before I came to Japan, I was reading a newspaper article about the new weight chatter tool that I think has been developed as an extension for Google chat by people at MIT. It's a kind of, you can basically, it gives you little um, vocabulary micro quizzes that you can do in those few idle moments while you are waiting for an instant messaging reply to pop up. Now clearly these informal kinds of learning opportunity have intrinsic value and indeed motivational value. In other words, the feeling that you are learning without really having to try hard or to concentrate for long periods of time. But of course it's important that students also understand the limitations of this kind of casual, informal learning or bite-sized learning, in the sense that these kinds of learning may not engage the deeper levels of cognitive processing or the metacognitive skills and efforts that are needed to develop and achieve mastery in a language. See, for example, Wang and Smith, 2013. So this brings me back to what I was saying earlier when explaining the difference between these two concepts of autonomy. Essentially, autonomy one, in the sense of personal agency and self-determination, may motivate students to engage informally with technology, to serve language learning purposes, and particularly to exploit tools and features that they find quick and easy to use, or fun, or interesting, and not too demanding. But as I was saying earlier, this psychological sense of autonomy shaping self-determined motivation doesn't necessarily lead to engagement with the more cognitively and linguistically challenging aspects of language learning. And for this we need autonomy too, or learner autonomy, that is taking responsibility for and regulating one's learning, thinking strategically and creatively and exercising metacognitive skills and effort. 
ultimately then, this, I think, places a premium on our role as teachers in providing the pedagogical structure and support to scaffold the development of students' strategic thinking skills, their language learning awareness, and their metacognitive know-how. And in this sense, in relation to working with technologies or teaching in technology-enhanced learning environments, the pedagogical message, I think, is no different than it is in, te in teaching in any kind of learning environment. So whatever the motivating properties and language learning affordances of particular technologies, at bottom, what matters, I think, are on the one hand, the motivations, the understandings, and the metacognitive capacities that our students bring to the language learning process and bring to working with technologies. And on the other hand, what matters is then what we as teachers, how we meaningfully support and facilitate these motivations, understandings, and metacognitive <coughs> capacities through our day-to-day -day interactions with our students in order to foster their autonomy as language learners and to foster their motivation and their ability to use technologies strategically and creatively to serve their language learning needs. And that was a very long sentence to end on. Sorry about that. Thank you very much for being here.